Um, right, so I think the, the areas that I wanted to investigate this morning were basically what butterflies do we have? We've had 30 different species of butterfly recorded on the patch. Uh, when do they appear? Um, is there anything special about their lifestyles that we should be interested in? Um, that does have conservation, uh, bear, conservation bearings as well, because if there are problems in some of the fundamental things that they depend on, um, particularly larval food plants, um, that is the most important thing, but also um, adult food as well, then this is going to have an impact on the, uh, the butterfly populations themselves. So basically, what is it that keeps them in our local area? Um, and are their flight seasons changing as well? There's a lot of uh, evidence that the phenology, that's the timing of different stages of the life cycles of different butterflies are changing. That can be a positive thing for them. Uh, it can also be a negative thing for them. So, quite often the first butterfly to appear, and in fact the first five butterflies in this presentation are all ones where a significant proportion of their population uh, overwinter as adults. So sometimes people report when they're doing a bit of clearing out in their garden shed in the middle of winter, they might come across a, a red admiral. This is quite often the first one seen in the, uh, the, the early year, a very, very distinctive uh, butterfly, certainly not uncommon in our uh, area. Um, last year, I noticed my first one on the 28th of January. Um, uh, it was a little bit later this year. Uh, and my last one last year on the 23rd of uh, December. So it really is an all round butterfly. But most of the summer population we have are butterflies that have arrived from the continent. Um, big influxes take place particularly in May and June. Um, I'm going to say something about the larval food plants, the, uh, the basically the food that the caterpillars eat, because without this, we're not going to have sustaining populations of, uh, of, of any species. So for Red Admiral, common nettle um, is key for caterpillars and our area is full of common nettles. People moan about them, they don't look very pretty, they sting you, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, if you took the common nettles out <laughs> of our area, our butterfly populations would take a massive uh, hit. There's one generation of this uh, species. I'll say a little bit more about generations later on. And the adults, you've probably seen them maybe in your garden or as you're walking around, they'll feed on the flowers of uh, Budlia and brambles. They're very, very popular ones for the adults when they're nectaring, gaining energy from sugar-rich uh, nectar. But they also feed on rotting fruit and the uh, sap of trees as well. Best place to look locally? Anywhere, anywhere you could uh, see Red Admiral. Another of the early ones is uh, Peacock. Again, adults uh, over winter. Uh, it's got these very distinctive eyes that act as both a warning and a distraction. Quite often, if you take lots of uh, pics of this species, you'll notice bits of the wing missing and particularly um, the eyes very often will be uh, missing. They do tend to be targeted by, uh, by birds. But of course, if a bird takes out the eye of a peacock's wing, it's not gonna kill the butterfly. It, it might make it harder to fly, but it's gonna keep going for uh, a, a little while longer. Um, if it takes out the, uh, the actual head of the butterfly, then it's dead. So this is something that's developed um, through the course of uh, many, many millions of generations of uh, evolution. Um, the first of these that I saw last year, and if people have got earlier records, please record them because this is all valuable stuff. My first last year was on the 17th of uh, February. Again, the larvae, probably the favorite food of caterpillars, and this will be the female, where the female, the adult females lay their eggs, common nettle, <coughs> and it, it features time and again. 
Uh, as far as the adults are concerned, they can often be seen feeding on the flowers of, of buddleia, brambles, uh, blackthorn, which of course flowers very early in the, uh, the spring, many other flowers as well. And this butterfly likes to bask in open areas. So if you're wandering around and see a patch of bare ground um, in the sun, very often you'll find a peacock butterfly uh, basking there. Brimstone is a, a, another one that overwinters as uh, an, an, an adult. Um, last year, my first emergence, uh, the, the first one I saw, uh, was on the 22nd of uh, February. And there is a story that the uh, original Old English name, um, butterfly, came from butter coloured fly. And there's a suggestion that uh, it originated with uh, butter coloured uh, brimstones. We'll probably never know whether that's true or not, but it sounds like a good story for uh, a Sunday morning. Um, in terms of adults, this is probably our longest lived uh, UK species. So adults that emerge um, uh, it, it late uh, in, the, uh, in the summer may live through the autumn, go into hibernation, spend the early part of the year in hibernation, fly again in, uh, in spring, then mate, females lay eggs, uh, and the cycle continues, but over a, cord, a, a period of uh, 10 months. So the idea that butterflies, you know, just around, just around for a few days and that's it, it's, uh, it's not always the case. Obviously with the populations of any butterflies, uh, they take a big hit from uh, predators, particularly uh, pre um, uh, birds, but uh, a, a lot of them are capable of living a lot longer than that. Um, the, um, the adult brimstone has a longer proboscis than uh, um, probably any other um, UK butterfly species. Uh, so it can take nectar from flowers that uh, other butterflies can't, for example, teasel. Um, but it also feeds on thistles, knapweeds, dandelions. Um, the larvae um, are largely dependent on buckthorn and alder buckthorn. We don't have a huge amount of that in our area, so that probably explains why we're not overrun with this species locally. Um, but it's recorded every year in reasonable numbers. This year, um, I think I saw my first ones a little bit later than last, but certainly in March, and I find Evelyn's Avenue is a good place to, uh, to look. Okay. Um, small tortoise shell. This is the last of the series of early butterflies that have spent the winter as uh, adults. Um, last year, my first emergence date was the 25th of uh, February. Um, but populations of this butterfly seem to have declined quite dramatically in the UK. Um, and there's a suggestion that this is due to problems with global climate change, global warming. Nothing particularly obvious, but the activities of um, a parasitic fly called Sturmia bella, um, which Tony would probably know a lot more about than, uh, than me whose population has increased in this country uh, with warmer weather conditions. Um, it lays its eggs near the, uh, uh, the butterfly's caterpillars. The caterpillars eat the, uh, the eggs. The eggs then hatch inside the butterfly. The larvae within the small tortoise shell um, caterpillar then eat out its uh, insides in order to, you know, uh, so that they can uh, develop to the next stage. And the fly then emerges from the tortoise shell caterpillar. So the fly has gained a big advantage from this. Obviously, the, uh, the caterpillar of the small tortoise shell hasn't. And that's thought to be one of the reasons for uh, decline in numbers. Fascinating, absolutely uh, fascinating stuff. Um, Again, the caterpillar's food plant, 
um, uh, common nettle features very, very strongly. Um, comma, uh, my first record last year, again, was the 25th of February. You, you notice the 25th of February crops up quite a lot from last year. It was, a, I don't know whether people remember, but late February last year was exceptionally warm. So a lot of um, adult butterflies that had been hibernating were encouraged to, uh, to come out. More typically, um, an early flight date would be uh, March. And then a new um, generation after mating, egg laying, pupation um, would be uh, in uh, late June. Uh, so the, this generation, the fresh generation, if you like, of commas, is now on the wing in our area. Um, places to look, back gardens, woodland glades, for example, plenty of areas in uh, Wanstead Park, bushwood and more open areas as well so grassland edges where you've got brambles and trees a good place to look and there were some very fresh uh, newly emerged adult commas around at the uh, at the moment and um, this is just uh, the underwing you can see there if you look at the uh, the underwing that little white mark uh, vaguely reminiscent of a scruffy comma. Um, that's how the, uh, the butterfly gets its name. Um, okay. Holly blue is our next butterfly to emerge, typically in, in this area. Um, my first sighting this year was on the 31st of March. This is the blue butterfly that's most likely to be seen in your, your back garden. Um, it flies higher off the ground than our other blue butterflies, which are grassland butterflies and usually don't get more than a few feet off the, uh, off the ground. Um, Holly blue has two or three generations every year with the adults of the second generation emerging at the end of June and a smaller one at the end of uh, September, if uh, weather conditions are okay. And I think these days weather conditions do tend to be okay because the, uh, the sun has been extending far later in the, uh, in the year. Um, the larval food plants of holly blue, holly, ivy, brambles and gorse, which we've got masses of locally. Lots of people have got um, uh, at least some of those elements, perhaps not the gorse, but the other, the other things in their, uh, their back gardens. Um, this is the first butterfly I've mentioned where the adults have a preference for honeydew, which is produced by uh, aphids. Um, they'll probably go for this more than they will uh, flowers to get their uh, energy, although they do also feed on the flowers of uh, bramble. And, uh, and holly. And small white, the other one there, is uh, locally, it's, um, it's touch and go, which is the earliest white to appear locally, but um, I found small white usually is the first. Um, this year, uh, 21st of March, was the first date recorded for, uh, for this. Two or three generations uh, a year, with adults of the second appearing in, uh, in July. Um, the larvae, uh, the caterpillars feed on various cabbage plants and wild mignonette is the other one. We do have some of that uh, locally. Um, adults will feed on thistles, bird's foot trefoil, um, ragworts, knapweeds, and a variety of other, other plants. Now, orange chip, this is, this is one of my favourites. Um, the males are very obvious um, because they do what it says on the tin. Very obvious bright orange patches on the, uh, the wing. They're very active in spring. Um, late March, early, uh, early April. I think this year, the 3rd of April, was the other uh, first record locally. Um, the males who go flying around in search of females that tend to be a lot less active. 
Um, the orange is a warning to predators to stay away. Um, I taste bad um, because of a buildup of uh, mustard oils in their body. I've never actually eaten an orange chip. I hasten to add, but I understand that uh, mm -hmm. this is uh, a warning for predatory birds and others that <coughs> I taste pretty yucky, so uh, keep clear. Mm -hmm. This isn't so much of a problem for the females because they're more sedentary, but if you've got a very active male orange tip flying around through, uh, through an area of uh, woodland, you are going to be a target for uh, a predators, uh, predator uh, otherwise. Um, the caterpillars feed on a bit more specialists than some of the, uh, the, the butterflies I've mentioned so far. They, they'll feed on the leaves of garlic, mustard, and cuckoo flowers. Now, for people who know our area quite well, there's a lot of garlic mustard around the uh, riding stables at the end of Empress Avenue. Uh, there's also cuckoo flower around there as well. And I would say in early spring, this is the best area to, uh, to look for uh, orange tips. The adults, you know, more Catholic in their, their tastes, they'll feed on the nectar of brambles, bluebells, first time I mentioned bluebell uh, today, um, dandelions and garlic mustard uh, as, uh, as well. It overwinters as a chrysalis, as a, as a pupa, um, and the, uh, the adults will emerge pretty early, uh, early spring and will be on the wing until uh, mid-May. Sometimes there's a small second generation in late August, apparently. I've never noticed it locally, but I'd be very interested uh, later in the summer if people have any sightings of orange tip, because this is the sort of data that we need to be trying to build up, not just the first date they appear, but also if there are second uh, and, and subsequent generations uh, as, uh, as well. That's the male, um, that's the female. All, all the pictures in this presentation are my own, apart from this one, which you'll probably say this is the, the best photograph of the mm -hmm. uh, presentation. This is a fantastic photograph that Cathy Hartnett uh, took a couple of years ago the underwing of a uh, female orange tip. And it's important to know this one because female orange tips and small whites on the wing look virtually indistinguishable. So really it's worth in spring not dismissing every small white you see. If you can see one with its wings closed, if you get a view of the underwing, have a look. Um, a, it'll tell you that uh, it's an orange tip, but it's a sight to behold. I think that that pattern is just absolutely wonderful. And you can see the brilliant camouflage that would normally give uh, with a backdrop of uh, vegetation. Superb. It's not all, always bright colours, I think, that, uh, that give beauty. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, this is um, locally one of our few woodland butterflies. Um, it can be seen flying on an overcast day. It can be seen flying even the most shaded parts of um, uh, Wanstead Park, um, Bushwood, Longwood. Um, males are very territorial. They emerge in early uh, May, first week of, uh, uh, sorry, in early April first week of uh, April, typically around here. Uh, the caterpillars feed on various grasses that we've got on, on Wanstead Flats, along the sides of uh, woodland glades in Wanstead Park uh, as well. Um, but uh, the adults feed mostly on honeydew, but also on uh, bramble and uh, ragworts. It's a very, you, you can see this species on the wing locally for a very prolonged period of time um, because it has two or three generations during the course of the year. Um, so you would typically be able to see it from March to the beginning of November if the, the weather's reasonably <coughs> mild at the beginning of uh, November. And it's unusual because 
Unlike the first few butterflies I went through that spend the winter as uh, adults, they hibernate as uh, adults. And um, uh, most of the others that spend the winter as uh, pupae, um, speckled wood can winter um, as pupae or as larvae. They, the, uh, the caterpillars can actually survive uh, our winters as uh, larvae as well. Plenty of places locally to see uh, this one, any, anywhere where there are, are, are trees, uh, basically. Um, green veined white, um, again, it's another common butterfly. Uh, two generations, the adults will emerge in uh, April. Um, a second, uh, stronger um, uh, brood emerges in late June. This two here who were mating, I took this photograph on Thursday, um, just up the, uh, the, the Roding Valley in a fantastic area of um, grassland that I'll mention uh, a little bit later on. So this will be the, uh, the start of the, uh, the, the second brood. And I suspect this year as well, um, I think they've had a good season, uh, assuming weather stays okay through to late, uh, the, the late summer, there'll probably be a third brood in September. Um, the larvae um, feed on a whole range of uh, plants, uh, including uh, cabbage plants, uh, hedge mustard, garlic mustard, charlock, and the adults will feed on the normal, uh, the normal team of, uh, of very, very popular flowers for pollinators. That's knapweeds, thistles, ragworts, and vetches. And this one can be seen pretty much anywhere in our area. Green hair streak is a fantastic success story uh, locally. Um, the first local record was the 27th of May, 2013, a date I remember uh, very well. Um, this beautiful uh, butterfly has gone from strength to strength in a local area. The first little colony was in Longwood. Um, it subsequently spread out to various areas of Wanstead Flats. It's now been recorded in people's gardens. Uh, Rose had one in her garden in Forest Gate um, uh, this, uh, this spring. Um, the first one I saw and the first one in our area this year um, was on the 12th of April in the old sewage works. So it really has spread its wings and colonized lots of uh, new areas. Uh, the caterpillars feed on broom, gorse and bird's foot trefoil locally. With all these things, I've missed out some of the plants that they feed on that aren't found in our area trying to, uh, to keep it um, relevant to what we've got uh, locally. Um, and the adults will feed on hawthorn, gorse and bird's foot trefoil as well. The best place to look at the, um, the probably the third or fourth week of uh, April, uh, they're not on the wing anymore, uh, but next year, if you want to look, um, Longwood on Wanstead Flats is a wonderful area to, to look. We had some quite good uh, counts. I think I counted 17 on, on one day, and I'm sure that's a gross uh, underestimate, but um, a, real, uh, a real success locally. Um, this is one of our true grassland uh, butterflies, a small copper. Um, the caterpillars feed on sheep sorrel and common sorrel, uh, which we've got lots of on Wanstead Flats and uh, in Wanstead Park as well. Gives this lovely sort of uh, pinkish uh, hue to the grassland in, uh, in spring, uh, that the, the sorrels do. Um, and this fast flying butterfly can be seen from mid-April um locally my earliest records the 14th of uh, of april um providing things go okay it has three generations a year um so the second one uh, will emerge the adults will emerge late june um through july so there are a few on the wing now, which I, I think belong to the second generation, but their numbers should build up 
over the next couple of weeks. So if you're on a walk uh, around the plain in Wanstead Park or on Wanstead Flats, take a look for this one because the, the vibrancy of the orange there is, uh, is stunning, I think. And then um, a third generation, so late September or early October, uh, it's worth looking out for uh, another one. I've only got scant information on the third generation locally. So again, be very uh, interested in, in people's sightings as the year progresses. Um, Common Blue is another one found in very similar places to, uh, to Small Copper locally. Um, um, if you walk past a patch of bird's foot trefoil, uh, spend a few minutes watching it in the right season and by that I think we're we're talking about from the middle of April um, through May uh, with a second generation emerging in July but it's always worth watching birds for trefoil um, apart from the fact that it's a beautiful flower um, this butterfly really does uh, love it um, but it'll feed on clovers, uh, vetches, knapweeds uh, as well. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the larvae, the caterpillars, are dependent on bird's foot trefoil and black medic. So uh, that means that areas like the brick pit on um, Wanstead Flats, particularly the, the west end of it, where you've got that lovely bank that faces east, that's a great place to look for, uh, for common blue, but you can find it in Wanstead Park uh, as well. Uh, large white, um, very successful um, butterfly, uh, two or three broods, um, April, July and September. Again, the first this year was on the, uh, the 15th of uh, April. Um, I'm conscious of the time. So. We've still got quite a few butterflies to deal with. Painted Lady is one of our most stunning uh, ones. This is one I photographed about a week ago in Budlia in the, uh, the old sewage works. Um, it's a migrant uh, to this country, arriving from March onwards. The dates are unpredictable. The numbers that turn up are uh, unpredictable. Um, uh, Last year, the first one was seen on the 15th of April. Uh, this year, not until late June. So it doesn't look as if this is going to be a classic painted lady year. Um, last year was good. Um, I think uh, James counted 11 on one walk across Wanstead Flats uh, last year in, uh, in late June. Um, an extraordinary uh, butterfly, both in terms of the length of migration, a strategy. It was always thought this was a rather bizarre thing that loads and loads of these turned up in uh, summer in this country. But it seems to be a strategy where uh, there will be a big arrival from the continent. Um, butterflies will breed. The, um, the, the life cycle will progress very rapidly and a new generation of adults will emerge and fly north uh, to breed further north. And they've actually, um, they get some painted ladies, get as far as the uh, Arctic Circle, but in a series of, uh, of steps. Um, some years, the migration is absolutely phenomenal. In 2009, it was estimated, although how you estimate things like this, I don't really know, but it was estimated that 11 million arrived in an emergence and were photographs of plants just on the Norfolk coastline, just plastered in uh, painted, uh, painted ladies. What's always interested in people is why the re return migration is never uh, seen because these butterflies do return south, or a lot of them do. But it's been discovered that uh, they, they fly at height at um, uh, above uh, 500 meters, so they're not visible for the ground, from the ground uh, in, uh, in general. Anyway, that's, uh, that's definitely one to, uh, to look out for now to see whether there are any indications of any sort of uh, migration this year. Small heath is another grassland butterfly 
that can be found locally in the same sort of areas as small copper and uh, common, uh, common blue. Um, numbers of this butterfly are in serious decline. Um, this is one really to uh, be concerned about because the, the caterpillars do like fine grass, grasses, the sort of grasses that are typical of acid uh, heathland, but which can all too often be um, overrun by uh, coarser grasses, uh, particularly if uh, a lot of nutrition has been put into the soil. So um, they, they like um, uh, fescues and uh, bent, those, those sort of uh, fine grass. But we do have good numbers in the triple SI on Wanstead Flats uh, and on the plain in Wanstead Park. But this is where management can help a butterfly um, because my suspicion is if those areas are left, if they're completely overrun with coarser grasses, then this is a butterfly that we could uh, lose locally. Um, the adults will nectar on buttercups, yarrow, brambles, stitchworts, um, uh, generally smaller flowers than uh, some of our uh, other butterflies. Brown Argus is another uh, local success story really. It was first identified here on the 4th of June 2011 in, uh, in the old sewage works. Then we had a retrospective record from uh, 2005, but it looked like a butterfly that was very much just about hanging on. But I would say the last few years, uh, it's done better. And a lot of the management work that the Rain Group does in the old sewage works is with this butterfly uh, in mind. It needs open areas, the caterpillars um, are particularly um, linked with crane spills. Uh, particularly does for Cranesville and we've got a lot of that um, in the old sewage works and other areas as well. So this year it's being seen from the old sewage works and that strip of Wanstead Flats that runs along Centre Road down to Centre Road car park um, and also by Davis Lane, the um, Davis Lane School over there. So um, whether it was overlooked previously or whether this is an indication of this species doing a little bit better locally, it's unclear, but uh, a good one to, uh, to look out for anyway. Um, first one on the wing this year was the 12th of May, and we would hope for uh, a second generation kicking in in mid-July. So again, if you're going for a walk in any of these grassland areas, look out for this beautiful uh, species uh, from um, yeah the middle of, uh, of, of July onwards. Um, this butterfly often roosts at night with common blue. You, you can find both species together um, on grass stems. Uh, apparently I've never found both species roosting together but again something to, uh, to look for. Skippers don't get a particularly good, uh, um, good press. I think some people consider them to be a little bit like little brown jobs in the, uh, the, the bird world. Uh, I disagree. I think large skipper is, um, although its colours aren't particularly bold, I think there's a subtle beauty to them that uh, really makes this uh, a wonderful skipper. This is the scarcest of our three uh, local uh, uh, skippers. Um, but uh, it's usually on the wing from the start of June. Uh, first local record this year was the 30th of May. The males are very territorial, but they'll spend their time patrolling an area, um, looking for females, perched, doing nothing, often not feeding, um, which makes them relatively easy uh, species to photograph. Um, and feeding and the adults like brambles and thistles. Um, the caterpillars uh, go for grasses, so eggs will be laid, particularly on uh, coxfoot grass. Um, they're, still, they're still around at the moment. Um, there's um, a bold male, a patrolling male in the middle of bushwood at the moment, just close to the uh, purple hair streaks. If you go along to that area, 
just south of the pond in what used to be a pond in Bushwood early in the morning, there's a good chance of seeing one of these large skippers on the, um, on the uh, white poplar saplings that are there. Um, our two other skippers, um, apologies for the difference in font size there, I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, I don't like things like that, but I'm entirely responsible for this presentation. So um, anyway, Essex skipper and small skipper, often difficult to differentiate in the other uh, fields. These are our commonest butterflies um, in terms of uh, numbers huge numbers but very often you'll have to say well it's either an Essex or a small. Um, on Thursday I went up to an area of unmown grass, it used to be football pitches just up the Roding Valley not too far from here um, I'd been alerted to the fact um, that there were large numbers of butterflies there by rows and I did some quadrant um, counts on this, uh, this area to estimate how many butterflies there were on the football pitches. And the figure I got was about 12,000 skippers in this uh, area, a mixture of Essex and, uh, and small. Um, if you have a look at this one here, if you, you have a look at the, um, uh, the antenna that's visible there, the tip of it looks as if it's been dipped in a bottle of ink. Probably, I don't know how many people are even familiar with bottles of ink these days. A bottle of black, mm -hmm. uh, a tin of black paint. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's black all the way around. This is Essex Skipper. Um, it would be uh, pale on the underside, orangey colour if it was a uh, common uh, skipper. But they've got pretty similar lifestyles. The, uh, the caterpillars feed on uh, grasses. Uh, when they're adults, they feed on a wide range of, uh, of plants. We watched them on Thursday moving out of the grassland area to the margins of the field where there were lots of um, uh, thistles and um, knapweed and they were feeding there on thistles, knapweed and, uh, and brambles. Uh, meadow brown, um, another brass grassland um, butterfly. Um, uh, so this is one that emerges in the middle of June. It's very common <clears throat> locally. Uh, again, because it's grassland butterfly, you know, the caterpillars feed on grasses. The, the uh, adults will feed on a wide range of things. Note the, um, the eyelet there. There's, there's one white dot in the middle of the, uh, the eyelet. That's quite significant when we come to compare with another graph and butterfly that emerges a little bit later uh, in the, uh, the year, which I'll come on to in about two minutes, if Tony allows me. Um, purple hair streak, um, great little butterfly. Um, very closely tied to, um, uh, to oak tree. Um, places to look locally, Bushwood. I photographed these in uh, Bushwood during the, uh, the, the week. Usually they settle with their, their wings closed, as Bob said earlier on. So you see this distinctive white uh, line on the, uh, the underwings. Uh, if you do get a glimpse of the, uh, the upper wing, this wonderful uh, purple in the sunlight, it's, uh, it's quite uh, dazzling. The adults generally feed on, uh, on honeydew. Uh, the um, the uh, caterpillars feed on the, uh, the buds of oak trees. Um, another recent colonist, marble white. Um, I had um, a phone call from uh, a lady this morning who apologised for not being able to join in this presentation. Uh, she had seen and photographed one of these in a new area um, just um, opposite Queenswood Gardens um, on Aldersbrook Road, which I, I hadn't heard of marble white there before. This, this is a butterfly that's only appeared in our, our area in the last few years. Until three years ago, we were just getting single records a, a year and we're thinking, is this the start of local colonization? Well, two years ago, it clearly was because we were getting multiple records. Last year, they were seen in the old sewage works and on Wanstead Flats. Um, 
already this year, I think there are more. The, um, uh, the skipper site I mentioned just now, uh, when I was there on Thursday, there were several marble whites there. Rose had seen 10 in that area, so that could be a reservoir population for this spreading right through the park and uh, right through Wanstead Flats, which would be, uh, be brilliant. The adults, nectar on clover, uh, yarrow, thistle and uh, knapweed, and again the caterpillars uh, feed on, uh, on grasses. Um, just one generation for this, uh, this butterfly, so uh, we would expect it to be on the wing uh, through, uh, through July, and then that would be it for another year. Uh, ringlet is another, unless it was um, just not observed, not recorded, completely overlooked previously, we don't have any records of uh, ringlet uh, until July 2013. But it's now a butterfly that can be seen um, in a whole number of different places locally. Um, if you tell people, oh, it's a brown butterfly, they're not going to be very excited. But look at those, uh, look at those eyelets there, aren't they? Aren't they stunning with that creamy buff surrounding the black and the white dot in the, uh, the middle? I, I think that's, that's really, really, uh, really, really gorgeous. Um, the, uh, the caterpillars of this species feed on grass, um, but the, uh, the adults go for thistles, ragworts, brambles, the normal, the normal culprits that have been cropping up time and time again in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, the earliest record we've had locally is the 18th of June, a little bit later this, this year, but they are on the wing now. Um, I saw some uh, behind the tea hut uh, a few days ago, also on Belgrave Road, Wayleave, and I think other people have seen them elsewhere as well. Tony saw one up the, uh, the Roding Valley on, um, on Thursday. I wish... Um, Two years ago, we had a silver wash fritilla in Wanstead Park on the 26th of, uh, of June. Um, yeah, they're increasing in the north of Epping Forest, an absolutely stunning large butterfly of woodland glades. It, uh, it, it doesn't flap vigorously, but it glides majestically on open, uh, open wings. There's only one problem, and I think the one we had two years ago was just uh, dispersing, having a look, uh, having a look round. The big problem is that the uh, the larvae need uh, uh, dog violets to uh, feed on, and we we don't have a lot of dog violets uh, locally. Um, if some could magically appear in the mm -hmm. park, that would be a, a wonderful thing. Um, anyway, it is worth looking because there will be dispersing butterflies and as the population in the north of the forest builds up, you'd expect more butterflies to, uh, to uh, appear on an occasional basis down here, but I don't expect it to be establishing a, a population anytime, anytime soon. The last of our regular breeding butterflies to uh, appear is the gatekeeper, um, which uh, the the eyelet on the wing, actually you can't see in this photograph, but it's got two, two little white dots in rather than one. Also white dots on the, uh, on the underwing as well. Um, I, th I think it's another very, very beautiful uh, butterfly. Um, the earliest date we've had locally for it is uh, 1st of July. So this week is likely to be the week when uh, we start to, to see them. Any areas, um, grassland edges particularly, if you've got bramble banks along the edge of grasslands, as in the Wanted Park and Wanted Flats, this is a great, uh, great place to, uh, to, to look. Um, how am I doing? Oh, have I? Oh, right, okay, okay. Um, and it's not all good news. I, I've mentioned a number of butterflies that have only been seen locally in area in the last five years, um, some of which are now appear to be established as, uh, as breeders. Um, ball is one that's gone. Um, I remember when this was quite a common butterfly in, uh, in Stratford, 
Um, and there were two records locally on our patch when I lived in Manor Park. I had this in my garden uh, twice in uh, July 1989 and uh, 1990. Um, it's subsequently gone from London. I don't, I don't think there are any in London now. I think you, you have to go down to the uh, Essex coast to see uh, this species. Why should that have happened? Well, again, this could be another victim of uh, global climate change, global warming, not again in the way that you would uh, expect. It's called a, a developmental trap because our summers were going on longer. Um, butterflies were actually, these butterflies were actually able to, uh, to mate and produce a third generation in late September and October. But unfortunately, it was too late in the day for those butterflies, too late in the season for those butterflies to be able to uh, survive. So large sections of the population got, uh, got wiped out. And it's thought that this could be why um, in those areas where it was never particularly common, um, it's, uh, it's gone completely. Maybe there's a combination of factors, but sadly, it is mo no more. Um, cloudy yellow is another migrant that's seen every, every year. Um, it's worth looking out for in July. And long tail blue um, is a, very common on the continent. Um, increasing number of records, and it has bred now in uh, south coast counties. Our first local one was, uh, was spotted on the 14th of September last year by uh, Christian Moss in uh, in Wanstead so later in the summer definitely worth uh, looking out for this one it hasn't survived an English winter so far um, one minute Tim maybe that will change so just um, uh, just concluding um, what do we do about it well please record your records even if you think oh I saw one of these earlier in the year Make a note of it because it could be a second generation, it could be a third generation, and that's always useful information to have. I record it, I expect Tony will say something more about uh, I record, or if you don't want to get involved in that, just email me and uh, I'll, uh, I'll take the record uh, on. So um, yeah, I will, uh, I will leave it there and we can have a discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. That was really useful. Lots of applause I can see around the, around the, around the uh, screen. Um, there weren't many questions on the way through. There's one from Bentit. Uh, what time of year will the nettles be needed? This is in reference to one of your earlier comments about nettles. Uh, so they have a patch in the garden but never see butterflies on them. Mm -mm. Uh, do, you, do you want me to... Yeah, uh, just have a quick, quick comment on that. As they, uh, as they come. Uh, well, um, I, I, would, I would say April is, uh, is a key time. Um, uh, by April, nettles will be coming up. So those, those butterflies that have uh, spent the winter will be emerging uh, from hibernation uh, at that time. Um, egg laying will be taking place and the females will want something to uh, lay their eggs on. So yeah, um, uh, April's a key month, I would say from larval development. So do you think there's a minimum patch size? So, oh, the size. Um, uh, I've, I've no idea really, to be honest. <laughs> no, I'm not going to give you any BS on that, no idea. I'm used to seeing huge patches of nettles in the old sewage works, which obviously like um, factories for caterpillars and, uh, and moths. But I would have thought even small patches would be absolutely fine. So once again, everybody, if you do find small patches of nettles with thriving caterpillar populations on them, let us know. That gives us the data and we can actually think about advising other people on what to do. Um, Another question from John, where might the painted ladies migrate from? Uh, right, well, um, originally they will be starting out from North Africa um, uh, and they have this sort of step migration. 
where they can get through stages of the life cycle very quickly. So they might make one step of a few hundred kilometers north. They can fly very fast, by the way. Um, they've, been, they've been timed 45 kilometers an hour. Um, so stop off somewhere a bit further north, uh, breed, um, egg, caterpillar, pupa, new generation, and if it's reasonably early in the, in the, uh, the year, those new generation or some of them will move north again. Um, I think there's a lot more research needs to be done with this, but uh, I think this is still the case that Painted Lady is the only Icelandic uh, recorded butterfly. They get into the Arctic Circle, but their origins are North Africa. So I, I put on to the uh, chat, if anyone wants to look, a link to an FSC Biolinks uh, YouTube video on insect migration. It's absolutely excellent and you'll learn some really surprising things about insect migration. And as Tim says, there's some amazingly, yeah, particularly the small hoverfly, Episurphus boltiatus, or the marmalade fly which flies hundreds and hundreds of miles in migrations. And a lot of the flies that we see have migrated from, from further south. So do have a look at that and that'll te to give you an idea of how the uh, migration's actually being monitored by the various groups that look at that kind of thing. So that's in the chat, there's a little link in there. So have a, have a look at that before, we, before you go. Um, question, I, for, sorry. Can I ask a question <coughs> uh, to Tim about uh, has he got any tips on how to identify flying white butterflies? <laughs> because <laughs> I, I despair because I see a lot of them flying around. They hardly ever settle. Um, and I just don't know. Can you habitat? I mean, is there, are there any tips on how you might identify them in flight? I've been looking at flying white butterflies for 30 years, Bob. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I, I, uh, 20... 29 years ago, I probably thought I could do it. Uh, I now know that I can't, um, but for a whole number of reasons. Um, there's size overlap for a start. Uh, there's all sorts of, um, all, all sorts of uh, perspective issues. So judging uh, flight is, uh, is, is very, very, very difficult. Big, big black patches on the corner of large, uh, large white uh, wings can be obvious but they're not always because if a butterfly is a bit warm um you know you can you can hardly see those so wait for it to settle that would be <laughs> my advice i mean there might you know i'm sure there are people out there who can who can do it but yeah no uh, my eyes aren't very, it's, it's 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 very tricky and you've got the orange tip uh, issue as well where a lot of a lot of orange tips female orange tips can be dismissed as um uh, small whites. I sometimes have trouble with male orange tip actually seeing the orange sometimes it's difficult for me. So. Okay. Well, well again if the butterfly is a bit worn or if the sunlight is a bit bright and it's not particularly close uh, yeah yeah I mean if you see a picture like the one I showed in the presentation it's obvious but it's it's not always that obvious in real life. Thank you. That's great. Um, another comment here. I dug up my bird's foot trefoil as I was told it was poisonous for cats. I, I hope people aren't digging it up. <laughs> you have to make a choice there, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, I've, I've just planted bird's foot trefoil in my garden, actually, despite my cats, so I have to keep them away from it. <laughs> if anybody wants any tips on um, plants to have in their, in their garden for butterflies, then just run through that that list of uh, things that i mean i know this comes back to the question do i want a tidy garden or not but even if you want a, a tidy garden if you have one corner of it that's a bit untidy um it will attract it will attract butterflies definitely and budlia is great for nectaring large butterflies um, but it's not that great for generally for uh, for caterpillars. So go have a little bit of bramble, have a few gnat weeds, have a little, little bit of ragwort, bird's foot trefoil, and keep the rest of the garden manicured. And uh, who knows what will happen? Yeah. 
Remember what we said last week, make sure you link up your patches of rough with next door's patches of rough, then you get a bigger patch overall, but it's easier to manage. There's an interesting one for future um, collective activity on people's part. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going through to see any other questions, mostly comments. Um, this is Peter. Can you say more about how REN management helps? Um, I'm, it's also about has Nettle increased on the OSW? So I suppose it's a general comment about how we manage the site for butterflies. Um, there, are, there are two things there, Peter. Um, the, the old sewage works has got two different characters. The upper part of it is quite nutrient poor and the management work we've done there has been quite successful where without wishing to eliminate bramble because it does play an important role we don't want it spreading across the grassland area so it would shade out the um uh, the crane spills that i, I mentioned earlier birds for trefoil etc that the um uh, species, grass and species like common blue and brown argus in particular rely on. We tried a similar, we have tried a similar thing in the lower old sewage works, but that's a lot more nutrient rich and rather than being able to expand on the area of grassland there, we've kept that area as it is, but it hasn't grown. The brambles have been replaced by nettles so yes the area of nettles has increased the area of brambles has decreased and the area of grassland which i was originally aiming for in the lower old sewage works has stayed the same so it's it's not it's been neutral there but it's been positive um up the top does that does that make sense Okay, lots of nods. It does, it does, yes. <laughs> I think we have to revisit the, well, literally we will be revisiting the lower part of the old sewage works in January, but have to uh, go back to the drawing board and think a little bit more. I, I think we should continue what we're doing at the upper part because it's working. With the lower part, we need to think a bit more about how we can improve the diversity there. It's yeah, clear. because the bramble has really, I'm uh, sorry, the uh, nettle has really, yeah, really yeah. increased in the last five years. Yes, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure at the moment the best way to proceed in that lower part, uh, but I'll be talking to people about that. Okay, <laughs> a fun question from John, which I suppose is supposed to be, what do butterflies do when it rains? Hide. <laughs> <laughs> they shelter. They're they're pretty they're pretty good at sheltering. Um, I I I see lots of this in my back garden with with moths. Um, so when it was raining on um, the early hours of Friday morning, incredibly, I mean they the ones that flew out of the trap to avoid the heavy heavy rain, they all made beelines for places that were were dry under leaves. Uh, under bits of overhanging brick yeah uh, how they do it I don't know but yeah they are amazing and the, one, the ones that don't hide drown <laughs> okay um, Katrina you, you mentioned this some about Essex Wildlife Trust do you want to say something about that I didn't quite follow what the point was no, it's just that the, every day during the 30 days of June, they've issued some information, you know, how to look after and how to plant, you know, flowers that might attract um, butterflies. So there's just a nice leaflet with helpful for behaviours and for identification if people want to look up their website or sign up for it. Really good tip. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Alan mentions the Big Butterfly Count on the 11th of July. Look at the website. I suppose Bob might be an idea to put a link on the website to encourage people to have a go at that. Um, we are over time, um, five by five minutes. I'm, I'm quite happy to talk about those damselflies for the last five minutes or so, but we'll do a sign off first. So anybody who wants to leave or needs to leave can go. And then those that are interested in damselflies, I'll talk about the difference between the green ones that you can find out there. So thank you very much indeed, Tim, for an excellent talk. Really enjoyed that. 
Um, don't forget, next week we also have Rosie Hollings talking about plants for bees. And of course, there's an overlap between bees and butterflies in terms of nectaring and forage. So definitely worth having a listen to that. OK, so thank you, everybody else. And anybody who wants to hang on, um, I'll wait a couple of minutes and then I'll start. OK, thanks. OK, for those brave people hanging on, um, the wonders of green damselflies. In the UK now, we have probably four different species that we can find. Um, probably the most common one is this one, which is the emerald damselfly, uh, Lesti sponsor. We're also sometimes called the emerald spreadwing as well. Male, female. Males are characteristically dainty little beasts. They are wonderful. They're called spread wings because unlike other damselflies, when they settle, they keep their wings spread open rather than folded over their abdomens. It's a very distinctive feature of these damselflies. None of the others do this. Um, the uh, Lesti sponsor, the males are characterized by green abdomen, green thorax, and these lovely blue eyes, which is sometimes quite difficult to see. You need to get quite close to them to really see some of these details, unfortunately. Having a good pair of binoculars with close focusing is really useful when you're looking at damselflies. And then characteristically, the first two abdominal segments and the terminal segment have this blue purinescence. So it's basically some uh, a color that will rub off actually over time if you're not careful. Sometimes it goes quite dark. But this emerges after a few days of emergence of the males. So early males look green here and become blue. So it's something to be cautious of for those of you who are experienced these things. If you've got a hand lens and a net and need to net things, what we often do is we use the male appendages to separate different species, but I'm not expecting you guys to do that. Although I can run a course on that if you want to know how to do it. So males, females, all green, no blue pyrenescence. They have these expanded area at the base of the abdomen is basically where the ovipositor is, which cuts into reeds to lay eggs into reeds uh, for overwintering. Um, notice that the, ab the side of the thorax has a green panel and then a creamy yellow panel underneath with no markings breaking it up. And that's really important for discriminating between this species and others, the females. No blue eyes, but slightly greenish eyes. So that's the, we used to be the most common emerald damselfly in this area, but it isn't any longer, which is a bit interesting. And there's lots of discussion we can have about that later about management of ponds and so on. This is a tip, used to be a typical species of um, small ponds, smaller areas of water with lots and lots of emergent reeds um, and few ducks because they tend to be quite vulnerable to ducklings predating them because they hang over the side of water within easy reach. Oops, you know, it's not working. Why is it not working? There we go. So this is Lestes viridis or the willow damselfly which in our area has now become the dominant emerald species, although it's a recent colonizer to the UK. Um, similar sort of shape, both male and female, um, to the emerald damselfly, perhaps a little larger. But the characteristic features in flight and in the hand, as it were, uh, or seeing with binoculars, is this characteristic pterostigma, this colored panel on the tip of the wing, which is pale in the case of Lestes viridis, and this darker brown, you can just about see it in Lestie's sponsor. Okay, so that's a really important characteristic. The male doesn't have any blue pyrenescence. It's also a darker, more bronzy green than the green of the emerald damselfly. So again, you can, it's, it's a relative thing. If you recognize it, you'll see it. You'll gain experience with that. There's also a difference in the male appendages, which is why the male appendage is so important. You can just about see it here that with the, can you see me? Yeah. With the emerald damselfly, if you look at me, at the inner appendages have a kind of hook to them. Whereas in the willow damselfly, they're hooked outwards. So that's a subtle difference between them, <laughs> which you need to get up close and personal, but it's a very distinctive feature in these two species. The females, um, again, very similar between the emerald and the willow spreadwing. Um, plus a more intense green, again, these nice pale terra stigma. But importantly, the lower creamy yellow markings are broken by this little green spine. 
again so that helps you to separate these two species the females of the two so the males lack of blue purinescence the females this spine on the side of the thorax the male have that spine as well but they're much more distinctly different from leslie's sponsor because of that lack of blue but these are the most likely ones you're going to see on Wanstead Park. Okay, um, certainly last year I couldn't find any common emeralds at all. The exciting one to look out for is this one, which is Lestes Barbarus or the Southern Emerald Damselfly. Again, a little bit similar perhaps to the willow, but a darker or more olive green with much more. Uh, color, creamy color on the lower abdomen. Again, there's a difference in the appendages. I'm not going to go into that at the moment, but the distinctive feature is the pterostigma is bicolored. It has two, it has a brown panel and a lighter panel, and that's the only one of the two that has this. Sometimes in some slightly faded specimens, a sponsor, it can look two toned, like here, for example but you just need to, the, it, it's, this is never, it's a kind of merging of color as opposed, oops, going the wrong way, as opposed to this very distinct border between the two panels within the terra stigma. Female, very similar again, I guess that two banded, two colored uh, terra stigma. And again, this kind of, almost as if the um, plates of the thorax and the abdomen have been painted with a creamy color uh, in between them. So quite distinctive there, okay. So very common, we're not likely to see it this year because it's still a little bit away from us, but you never know. So if you see an emerald damselfly, you're not quite sure, grab a picture of it, take a sketch, describe it, let me know. And, be, and I'll, I'll rush down to find out whether it really is one or not. Now you'll see me cycle very, very fast doing mm -hmm. that. The other one which is interesting, which is Lestes Dryas. This is the damselfly I used to work with in the RSPB at Rain and Marshes a few years ago. Um, it's called the scarce emerald damselfly because it is scarce and it has a really interesting ecology. Unlike these other damselflies which lay their eggs in water or over water which is freestanding all year, Lestes Dryas is it uh, um, uses fast drying pools of water. So pools that form in spring the eggs will hatch in there. The larvae will then grow up in water bodies that are going to dry out. The advantage for the larvae is that there are no predators because most predators are there all the year round, including other dragonfly larvae, for example, which may take two to three years to, to develop. So they avoid predation in that way. But it also makes them very vulnerable to very hot summers where you get rapid drying of water. So they, their populations bounce all over the place. In terms of identifying, these are the most robust of the damselflies. They're quite big and chunky, very distinctive when you see them. Look a the males look a little bit like Nestie's sponsor, the common emerald, but the blue purinescence only covers the first segment and half of the second segment on the abdomen. Okay. And yet again, there's a, there's a difference in the male appendages. So you're doing really, for an absolute identification, you need to look at the, um, the male appendages. Females are even more tricky to discriminate from um, common emeralds because there's a slight difference in the ovipositor and the shape of the ovipositor, and that robust feel, and there's a slight hook which is different from viridis on the side of the thorax. So you can see the differences are quite subtle. You need a really good view or to grab these in the hand to be able to confidently uh, discriminate them. Unless you're used to their, their jizz is different. You can actually see that the way they fly is different. I mentioned Dryas because there is a report at the moment, I think Chris Ganaway is still here, of uh, scarce emeralds now being found in Fairlot water, which I find incredibly exciting. Um, I'd like to know more about this if anybody, I haven't actually seen them there myself, I'm not sure where they are. But if that's the case, that really is quite exciting because up until now, most of the scarce emeralds have been coastal or on coastal margins, uh, where we find there's a lot of drying marsh and slightly brackish water and uh, uh, which they seem to, to, to like. So that'd be really exciting to, to see some, some appearing locally. And as you can imagine, when we talk about some of the um, areas in Bushwood, we talk about ponds that dry out regularly now. These are ideal environments for Lestes dryers to colonize if they can find their way to these ponds. And that's a big if. It's, they're not great spreaders. They're not great colonizers. We know that those in, in Renham Marshes a few years ago probably spread from the North Kent Marshes. 
uh, and only managed to maintain a very tenuous toehold in the northern uh, uh, Thames estuary. So they don't they don't really colonise and spread particularly well for some reason. Okay, that's my Steve? little yeah yeah. Uh, while it's up there, is the dark terra stigma on the scarce emerald distinctive? Um, because it, they, it looks quite dark and it seems to have a sort of white flash either they, side. They can be, but they're surprisingly difficult to see in the field. Mm. Um, and the other problem with terra stigmas in particular is as the as the damsel flies age, they tend to look a bit battered and they're not very good recognition features. Um, it's always nice to be able to find fresh emerged specimens if you can. <laughs> but having said that, the fresh ones don't necessarily have the blue pearlescence that is allows you to confidently identify them. For the males, it's always down to the appendages. For the females, looking at the structure of the ovipositor and the side of the thorax. And the dead giveaways. Tim? Yes, you mentioned common emerald damselfly. In all my years looking around Wanstead Park, I've never managed to uh, find one. Um, the first willow emerald was that I was sitting in Jules' back garden having a cup of tea and it, uh, it came into a tiny little pond. I was very excited because I thought it was a uh, common emerald, but it, it turned out to be a uh, willow. So if anyone does see common emerald locally, I, I, I would be very, very interested. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, yeah. the, the, the stronghold for Lestie Sponsor really was hollow ponds and the pond by the church on the other side of the road, which name I can never remember, the church in the forest. Um, mm. But even there, the emeralds have disappeared to be replaced by willow, yeah. but at much lower density. I have a horrible sneaking suspicion that some of the reed clearance work that's been done there is partly responsible for their loss, although I don't have firm evidence for that um, because I haven't actually recorded uh, the number of breeding species uh, pairs there. But there's no doubt that clearing reeds at the wrong time will actually remove the eggs from, um, from the vegetation, particularly if they're removed and not left. Okay. Any questions? I think um, one point that uh, Tim did make is if anybody wants to join our iRecord activity, do get in touch with, with us and we'll put you on the iRecord um, list, as it were, so you've got access to and can put up your records. If you're uncertain about it or unsure, do let me know. We, we can always organize a training session during the week if you need it. But that's the best way of making sure that we all find out what's around. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tony. Great stuff. Thank you. Good yeah. searching. Thank Thanks, Tim. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks very much.